Plenary, self-advocacy. Facilitator, Peter White, British broadcast journalist. Panellists, Saima Akhtar, employment coach. Umar Kayani, senior software engineer. Victoria Uruwari, opera singer. And Michael Smith, lawyer. So we're moving now into our self-advocacy plenary. And I'm thrilled to be joined by Saima Atka, Uma Kayani, Victoria Uruwari, and Michael Smith. Hello, guys. Wonderful to see you all. Um, in a moment, I think we're going to hand over to Steph. And if Peter's able to join us, she will also hand over to him. But to kick us off, I'm really, I really wanted to kind of introduce the idea of self-advocacy and what, what the purpose of this panel is. And I've got a brilliant definition from Disability Rights UK guidelines. So self-advocacy is defined as the ability to speak up for yourself and the things that are important to you. It means you're able to ask for what you need and want and tell people about your thoughts and feelings. Self-advocacy means you know your rights and responsibilities, you know you speak up for your rights and you're able to make choices and decisions that affect your life. And the goal of self-advocacy is for you to decide what you want and then develop and carry out a plan to help you get it. It doesn't mean that you can't ask for help. It doesn't mean not getting help from others, but it just means that you're making choices and taking responsibility for those choices. So I hope that that definition of self-advocacy provides that context. And I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves, setting out a bit about who they are, where, where they are in their, in their kind of journey, in their career journey, how they've got there and how they've self-advocated along the way. So I'm going to kick off with, in, in no particular order, I'm going to kick off Victoria, if that's all right. I'm going to hand over to you to speak for a few minutes um, about you and, and how you got to where you are today. Hello everyone, um, I'm Victoria Oruwari. I am a freelance soprano, but I'm also on the end of um, my training to become a psychotherapist. Um, that may sound a bit odd, but I've been um, singing professionally since 2008 when I graduated from Trinity Conservatory of Music and Dance. Uh, Trinity Lab and Conservatory of Music and Dance, sorry, they changed the name, that's why I'm getting confused. Um, I started out with my music career when I trained for my singing at New College Worcester, and then I also auditioned to get into music college, and wh whilst I was at Trinity, I, um, I attended, sorry, I'm just going to take my earphones off because the chat room is interrupting um, my thought process. Um, I did attend quite a few um, RNIB workshops on how to build my career and got good training on how to write a CV, how to market myself, how to dress appropriately for various concert events and things like that. Um, I also joined a few small opera companies that started out when I left college and I worked as I sang chorus in quite a few productions. Um, and then I started to do recitals and um, I often found that I was my own marketing person. I tried looking for an agent, but it was really hard to find one that was able to sort of market me in the way that I wanted to be marketed because I sing classical, but I also sing musical theater. I sing jazz and I didn't just want to be marketed as a classical singer. Um, to cut a long story short, I had met a lot of people that I would actually call angels along the way who have supported me um, and introduced me to other people after I have performed for them. Um, I also, to, to, you know, sometimes with singing, it's either feast or famine. You have lots of gigs sometimes and sometimes you don't. So I taught as a parapathetic singing teacher in a secondary school for like two days a week. And then I went, in 2014, I decided to stop teaching because I, I realized that it took a lot of energy out of me and I wanted to focus more on my singing and um, I went on tour and I had an amazing experience and I said to do more singing and I also thought that well if I wanted something a bit more stable to go alongside my singing I needed to train because I mean if, as a sighted person you can just go and get another job working somewhere in a restaurant or something or, or work in a box office I mean some blind people do that as well if the place is accessible to work in a box office uh, in a theatre or something, but it can be pretty tricky to do that type of job and then um, continuously. So I decided I wanted to train um, 
towards another profession that would give me the flexibility to still do my singing. Um, so I'm in my final year of a five-year training to become a humanistic psychotherapist and um, I um, have thoroughly enjoyed the journey. In the process, I have always had to speak to people about my access requirements and I just um, go about it by saying to people, okay, um, nice to meet you, um, you're the lecturer for this year, um, I would like to acquaint you with my access needs. So I just let them know what it is that I need and sometimes they may remember, sometimes they may not, and I'm never too shy to sort of remind people um, this is what I need. I've often found that when speaking for myself, I've learned to sort of not go on the offensive, but go on the, just describe the situation, you know, and, and, and add no like emotional impact to it because then people on, in, in, in return don't end up feeling defensive because when people are defensive is when they start to explain to you why something is not there and it's not their fault but if you sort of say okay i'm unable to do this because of that then it kind of okay oh yes okay well well because you don't have this then we're going to do that so that's one huge lesson that i learned working working with um, many non-disabled organizations also as a freelance musician i've often find i've had to work with several personal assistants and i feel like sometimes the ethos of a personal assistant is not properly understood where people might think that um, choosing a, pers a personal assistant kind of arranges your life and tells you what to do and when to do it. But I often come from the school of thought that my personal assistant is first accountable to me before they're accountable to any other person. And until I'm comfortable, um, their job is not done. So in that sense, we have a mutual respect for each other's time and space and what, what each of us want to achieve during the day and when during our working time and when the person should go on a break and, and this and that so i often go through a process of finding a personal assistant interviewing them making sure that their interests and mine are slightly i mean they don't have to be my twin but they always end up kind of having similar interests because that way i can trust them to make decisions that are right for me if i'm not in a position to do so and that really reduces um, stress levels when in unfamiliar places. So that has also been another way that I have worked. Um, so, um, so far, I sing for quite a few organizations and I'm, I'm a member of the British Power Orchestra, Belgian Music Foundation. Um, I've done a, sh a Christmas show at the Royal Opera House, which is quite an amazing experience as well. And I'm hoping by September to start my humanistic psychotherapy practice, which I'll be running from my home. And um, hopefully I'll do that two, day, two days a week and spend the rest of the week being a musician. Fantastic, Victoria. Thank you. So I can't believe that, that double world that you're living in. But I, I was so struck by your point about your personal assistance and ensuring that they are working for you and that you have that kind of ownership and authority. But also this idea of angels along the way and um and that's actually part of the journey and ensuring that you're open to connecting with people who will support you in in, in your career journey is is so so important i'm going to hand over to michael to just set out again your journey who you are where you've got to um and how you feel you've self-advocated on the way great stuff thanks olivia and uh, great to see so many people um all, all at, at this conference it really is a it's, it's really is a fantastic resource for, for everyone. So um, um, I'm Michael. I, um, I lost my sight when I was um, when I was 18. I'm now I'm now 30. Um, um, I'm now 30, and um, I lost my sight when I was at university, actually studying to become a doctor. So I was at a medical school in London called Bart. Um, I I then uh, didn't have any affiliation or connection with. Um, visual impairment at the time. So um, through uh, lots of networking um, and, and friends talking to other friends, we um, I, I stumbled um, across uh, charities such as the Vision Foundation and Blinded Business. And through that really powerful network, um, I, um, I bumped into people um, who had walked this path before. And it's always comforting to know that there are fantastic role models and angels as it was, as, as it was just referred to. And from there, I learned JAWS um, and learned how to use voiceover um, and went back to university, which was fantastic, and did a deg degree that I loved, um, which was um, geography um, in London at King's. Um, and then after that, 
um, I've got a really interesting business uh, and um, feel like, like I had a bit of a logical mind. So um, I went and um, managed to uh, get a training contract at one of the big uh, city law firms called Ashurst, where I practiced as a property lawyer for um, about five years. I was at Ashurst for about six years in total, including my training. Um, and about a year ago, um, I have just moved to uh, Blackstone, which is um, probably the, the, the largest uh, landlord of commercial property around the uh, around the world and owns um, big, big estates within London, like St. Catherine's Docks and um, sort of bits of Canary Wharf, um, Butlins. Um, so, 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 so very sort of uh, varied work. And I sit here as an in-house property lawyer to the, to the London team now really resonated to me um a lot of the things that were, were just mentioned but um i think self-advocacy is 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 so important and it's something that that if anyone can take something away from what i've got to say it's confidence have confidence in yourself we live in a world now where discrimination obviously still exists but you've got to be confident in yourself that any organization whether it be educational or work-based that you're approaching it's not an ivory tower it's um it's lots of people behind there who have mixed experiences and if you can talk to people on a level about your needs um full in full knowledge that those those people don't understand um or haven't come across visual impairment um but but really disarming those people to 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 to, to really make it a really comprehensive uh, a comprehensible and um accessible um sort of, sort of landscape of what 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 exactly exactly you need on a practical level i think all your other great qualities will will do the talking so um you know i'm a full jaws user here um i'm probably um I'm, I'm glad i'm not within earshot of anyone else here but i'm probably in in the most undiverse um uh, sector um um and part of london that that, that there is so there's lots of um there's lots of people here who haven't um, who haven't had much interaction with with disability or or any other diversity characteristic for that matter of fact, um, but you just got to talk to people on a human level. So a lot of the time I don't say I've got a visual impairment. I just say I can't see terribly well because a lot of people don't know what visual impairment need means and all of the associated um, challenges that 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 has a crop that, that 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 comes with. So have confidence in yourself because. The legislation in this country through the access to work scheme which is something i use through personal assistance that were provided by the access to work scheme and what is the great enabler and the great leveler which is technology um, that that allows you to, to bring you up to a level where you can operate really efficiently um with with everyone else you just operate a bit differently but but the output um the interactions um maybe some of the advantages that have come through via the pandemic through um, technology and ac accessible work, et cetera, um, have, have really um, gone in our favor. And I'm not saying it's easy, but you've got to have confidence in yourself and you have got to have confidence in the organizations that you're dealing with. There will be a small minor minority of organizations, whether they be international or just because of the people there, they'll just never get it. They, they will never understand some of the complications and challenges that you have but that is a very small minority now so at the three or four places that i've worked at my in my career from morgan stanley to ashurst in liverpool street to um to blackstone here um not many not many if 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 none um visually visually impaired people have progressed through here but it's just um it's just about educating people and 99 percent of people really want to assist you day to day make your life easier you make your, their lives easier through the work that you um, that you that you come out with. So um, yeah, I think two things I want to get across um, everyone is have confidence in yourself, um, um, communicate what what you really need, and and a lot of people don't understand what blindness or visual impairment means. So you know, just say I can't see terribly well, can't see very well, um, and you know, even if you're going into to prep for a sandwich, um, just going up to the to, to the people at the front instead of really struggling to try and find what you need um, to, to, to ask them. That's a big that, that's a big challenge, but something that you should be really proud about. And, and people just want to do the small things in life. They don't really know the big challenges of having a visual impairment um, day to day in London, but they, they would love to grab you a sandwich or they'd love to 
to show you to the right meeting room at work. People, people are always willing to help and no one's really out there to body check you. Um, so I think if you, if, if you go around with that, that mentality and that dispensation, um, I think, I think that's, that's, that's really important. And, and, uh, and then being great with people because, because that, that, that is all we do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just getting your point across in a, in a logical way, um, being kind to everyone, um, being, being able to, being able to, being able to communicate, communicate in a, um, a very efficient way with, um, with, with people around Europe. So I'm, I'm constantly flying between our portfolios and, Frankfurt and Europe and Dublin and, and being able to just communicate with all those different people um, very well is, is, is important. So I'll, I'll just hand back to you there, Olivia. Amazing. Thank you so much, Michael. So much there about your, your own mindset, really, that confidence, that positive expectation about those potential interactions and, and a willingness to ask for support, on, you know, or a openness to ask for support, recognising that that's, um, that's a positive. Um, I've quite excitingly noticed that Peter may have rejoined us. <laughs> He's laughing. So um, I'm going to do a little very succinct introduction. Peter, you're a tiny bit low in your frame, but you're definitely with us sound and video. Um, born in Winchester, Peter has been blind since birth, and I'm going to try and not give away his age, but I will say that he started his radio career having doorstepped Radio Solent in 1971. He then went on to host In Touch um, Radio 4's programme for visually impaired people. Yeah. Hello. And Have done... you got me? I've got you. We've got yeah. you through and through. I'm introducing you, Peter. Right. Just sharing that you've been, um, <laughs> that you've been hosting in touch since 1974 and all if you're not a regular listener to in touch you should be um and then peter turned his attention to tv uh presenting same difference and also became a presenter and producer of link which was central television's um show for disabled people in the light late in the 90s really in all of the 90s um since 1995 peter's been the bbc disability affairs correspondent and was the first totally blind person to produce reports for television news um, and over the last decade, he's written four series of autobiographical talks for Radio 4, as well as the acclaimed series, No Triumph, No Tragedy. Somehow, he's also got four children and published his autobiography, See It My Way, in 1999. I don't think you could be more qualified to run this session, Peter, um, now that you are with us. So just to get you up to speed, Michael yeah, and Victoria... Yeah, tell me how much you've already done. <laughs> <laughs> Michael and Victoria have shared their journeys and, and their experience both of self-advocacy, having a confident, positive mindset, but also recognising that there are angels and supporters along the way that make a huge difference. So I'm going to step away now and let you speak with Soma, Uma, and, and also any questions you have for the panel as a whole. Okay. All right. Um, I'll make this quick so we don't cut too much of Soma and Victoria. Um, really, all I wanted to say basically is um, I'm, I had a reputation for being argumentative from about the age of four. By the way, you'll have gathered I wasn't recruited to the BBC for my technological skills, um, <laughs> as I've just demonstrated. Um, but um, I, a job in radio arguing with people quickly seemed like an attractive option, but easier said than done. So I tried all the the normal routes, writing to them, applying for jobs, looking out for training ships, nothing worked. But when local radio came on the scene, I thought this is perhaps my chance because I thought they'd be more adventurous. So I resolved to forget applying for jobs. Uh, and now it's true, you always need luck, which I had a lot of, as well as barefaced cheek. So I was just being politely but firmly shown the door when I went to the local radio station that the producer had been asked to make a program for blind people, saw me, didn't catch up with me then, but I'd left a phone number. So he got in touch and uh, gave me a call. Uh, I went down there, got my foot in the door and walked out presenting the program for blind people. And I a lot of you will understand when I say the last thing I wanted to do was present a programme for blind people. I wanted to present programmes for everybody, but that was a foot in the door and it seemed very important that I should, should do it. Right. Um, uh, I won't give you my list of do's and don'ts. I'll do them if I've got them at the end. But let's go to um, Saima first to, um, to do her own presentation. 
Um, so my name's Saima. Um, I am registered blind and I've been blind since birth. I have an eye condition called Leber's congenital amaurosis. Um, and really my sort of journey started um, with me going to a specialist school. Um, now, I mean, we can, we can sit here and talk about the advantages and disadvantages of that, but you know, in essence, um, the advantage of that is it kind of, obviously I got, I got some education, um, I did really well. Um, I, you know, provisions were made for me, everything was accessible and that was great. Now, I reached the age of 16 and I was quite stifled by it and I wanted to sort of step out of that a little bit. Um, and the disadvantage, I guess, would of that was the fact that I honestly was not prepared because obviously everything was, I wasn't necessarily spoon fed, but obviously everything was made accessible and that was great. Nobody had really prepared me for the challenges of, you know, things not being access, uh, accessible, of having to explain to staff having a visual impairment meant because obviously every member of staff in this school knew what the visual impairment was and had to adapt everything was done for you and you know it just that's the way it was so really I went into a mainstream setting but it wasn't it was fine because there was a unit um a specialist unit within that setting um so what that meant was I was taking my A-levels with you know my sighted peers uh, and all the information, all the paperwork, everything that I needed was given to me via this accessible, um, this specialist unit. So it was a transition and it was a good transition, but it quickly taught me that, okay, not everyone understands visual impairment, which, I mean, people said that to me before I left. People, you know, sort of said that, but it, everyone painted a very kind of rosy picture of it and everybody said, oh, you're, you know, you'll be fine, you'll fit in and everything will be great. And it wasn't like that at all. Um, I had to advocate in terms of, you know, within my sort of set of peers because, you know, I was just automatically seen as the odd one out. And one thing I've learned, I mean, I sort of knew this anyway, but a lot of staff kind of tried to draw attention to the visual impairment. They tried to organize, you know, these sessions where you kind of blindfold your peers and get them to guide you. And to be honest, I think the best way to become you know, part of your group of peers is not to draw attention to your visual impairment. Yes, definitely be open to answering questions. Don't get offended when people ask them. But really, you need to show that you have other interests, other hobbies, other aspirations. I think the worst thing that they did was when they made it about my visual impairment. She is visually impaired, therefore you must include her. It was the most patronising thing they did. Someone actually suggested that I write a letter <laughs> and title it, dear friends and read it out in assembly. I mean, I, I was just horrified at the thought, but these were suggestions by not only staff, but staff that worked with, you know, the rehabilitation service with, the, these were staff that worked with visual impairment that were suggesting these things. And I still stand by the fact that they would have been the very worst things that I could have done at that particular point. Um, I'm not saying don't be true to, you know, who you are, you've got a visual impairment, don't be ashamed of it. And I'm not saying hide it, but what I'm saying is, you know, draw upon your other interests and try and build common ground with people that way and that's what I did mm. um and then of course the next step was university now that was interesting so I initially started at one university um went to Coventry to study English literature and creative writing again I was not prepared for what that would mean uh, you know as much as I transitioned to this specialist unit things were still made accessible for me uh, I still had that in place uni was a completely different ball game and, you know, I what I should have done is more research. I should have spoken to people who've been through the university system. I should have, you know, spoken to ex-students, um, possibly at the university or students that had studied similar courses, but I didn't do those things. I went into university thinking that I knew what I was doing. Um, and I struggled, really, really struggled. Uh, and ultimately I ended up dropping out of that university and starting my degree again elsewhere. And you could look at that and say it was a complete waste of time. And it was a waste of a year, but it made me who I am. I learned a lot about what I needed when I didn't get the things that I was used to getting. I learned when I, when I started my degree for the second time, I was a lot more prepared. I asked the right questions. I went in with solutions. And that's another thing I want people like to kind of people to take from this. You need to have the solutions because no one's going to have them. You go to your university and uh, lecturer and say, oh, I can't access this. They'll be like, OK, what do you want me to do about it? You need to know. You need to come in with a the solution, then they'll do it for you. They're not going to find the solution for you. Um, 
And I think that again comes with practice. It comes with having experiences. It comes with having, you know, having the knockbacks, making the, those mistakes. Because you know, if everything goes perfect, you don't know what you need because it's just there. When it's not there, then that's when you realize actually I need this. And yeah, I think the one thing I've learned um, through my experiences is to kind of not go in on the defensive, give people the benefit of the doubt. Because yeah, people do want to help and not everyone is open. I've had lecturers who are very resistant to change. I've had people to, um, they've taught one blind person in their lives and they think they know what it means to be blind. So I've had lecturers say, you know, no, this, this way is going to work better for you because this blind person did it. Well, you taught them 15 years ago, things have changed in the last 15 years and I'm not that blind person. So you need to be confident, know what you want, but give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, right. Saima, um, in that last point you made, I, I think, about you need to have the answers is absolutely brilliant. And that is, that was one of the things I was going to say was so important that you need to go with answers. Shall, shall we move on to our, our last presentation? Thank you for that, Saima, um, which I think is Uma. Um, cool. So, yeah, um, I'm Uma. Uh, I am a senior software engineer in test, uh, basically a fancy term for... I get paid money to break websites. Um, so I... Um, Would you like to break mine? <laughs> it's giving me a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, well, we can take a look, Peter, uh, after this. You know, we can have a chat. Um, <laughs> so um, basically, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start from my university time. Um, I studied multimedia um, at uh, Sheffield Hallam University. Um, and it was really cool. Like, um, the university, like, were very, very accommodating. Like, they knew straight off the bat. Okay, cool. So you've got a visual impairment. Um, what can we do for you? Um, so I was like, hey, um, I could do with X, Y, Z. Uh, they set me stuff up. So I started using Zoom text back in university. Uh, unfortunately, not a George guy like Michael, um, but uh, they set up um, Zoom text across um, my profile. So I could go to any, any computer in the university, log in, and I'd have Zoom text on there. Um, it made uh, getting to grips with uh, with the course very, very, uh, very, very uh, good. Um, the lecturers were super accommodating as well. Like they they would sit and literally they, they would just ask me about my vision for like 10, 15 minutes. Like when they initially got to know me, literally just sat down with me and just, just like said, tell us about your vision. And they were super um, honest and interested in it and they were like listen is there anything anything we can do to help and stuff uh, is there anything you struggle with let us know uh, all your lecture notes and stuff will be on um, like the online learning portal um, so you can access it um, which was really really awesome um, I left university um, and I started working in a call center because uh, I needed a job um, that was where things started to fall down um I, I i found out about ex access to work um and i was like hey um you know i spoke to my my manager at the call center and said hey um i need i need some software that can enlarge my you know my my screen and stuff and he he was like oh why why do you need that so i spent a while to speak to him and telling him and explain like hey this is this is what's going on and he goes, oh, okay, well, how, well, what, what can we do? How, how can we sort that out? And I go, well, you know, I can go through access to work and they can sort it all out. So, uh, yeah, eight months down the line, I got the software. And two days later, I said to my manager, hey, um, I've got a new job, so bye. Um, it, um, it was quite funny because... He said to me, okay, the first time I met you, I knew you wouldn't stay in this place. I knew, I knew you'd leave. And he, he meant that in the best way possible. Um, so I then went to a, uh, a graduate consultancy that taught me software engineering um, through a friend of mine who was working for HSBC's backend system. So when you put your card in the ATM, it does all this, all this magic wizardry. He was working on those systems. And I was like, okay, I'm jealous. I want to do that. Um, and then I went through this consultancy, um, and from day one, I said to him, hi, I, I'm, well, I've got official impairment, uh, and this is, this is what it means. And they were like, yeah, no problem. We can sort stuff out for you. 
fast forward to eight months uh, down the line, I was looking at some code and my my vision started just scrambling out. I, I started getting high contrast and I started getting dizzy. And I was literally in, in the academy center and people were looking at me and, and, and I, I tried to get up and I just, I, I just fell on the floor. And uh, then like the academy trainers, they, they picked me up, sat me in a room and they said, what's going on? And I, I said, well, I told you uh, eight months ago, I've got this problem. And you said you would sort it out. And they're like, oh yeah, well, we've not really had anyone with a visual impairment or a disability uh, work work for us. And I was like, yeah, but you've you've been going for like 25, 30 years. How is this not possible? So fast forward, and I eventually through the company, I got I got a job uh, working for Liverpool Victoria for the insurance firm. They were great. They they got me a super large screen, like no access to work or anything. I, I was like, you know, this is what's going on. Because initially in the interview, one of my friends was interviewing with me. He goes, hey, dude, maybe it's the time you start telling people, like potential employers, about your visual impairment. I was like, yeah, but uh, what about if they, I know it's going to sound bad. What about if they were like, no, we don't, no, like, we don't know about this. Like, a person's got visual impairment writing software for us. How is he going to be able to cope? Um, I'm glad, yes, I would. Uh they were very interesting all those points that you were making i'm just very quickly going to say the things i think are key things you'll have heard some of them this morning these are the key things and there are five of them first do your research it was a point that Simon made but it's be absolutely clear about what you do want and why you want it second choose your ground carefully some things are worth fighting for, some things are less worth fighting for. Pick your battles, but once you've decided them, don't give an inch unless you're sure it's the only way to get at least part of what you want. Thirdly, talk to the right people. By and large, go to the top. Pick the boss. They are much more likely to make promises that uh, people further down the chain won't have the confidence to make. And once a boss has made a promise, it's very hard for them to go back on it. So try to go to the top. Fourthly, work out your line and your arguments clearly and be sure that you've got the argument straight. Um, if you've got some sight, walk up and down in front of a mirror rehearsing it. If you're blind, you can walk up and down against a black wall, blank wall and do it. But rehearse it and finally know what you're absolutely entitled to check the law you can go for more than the law but knowing the minimum you're entitled to is very important so those would be my key things that it would i think it's, it's a good idea but the main thing is uh, and simon made the point you are the one who needs to know the answers as much as you can before you take people on those are my key points that's it's that's amazing peter thank you so much and my my uh, first regret today was that we couldn't chat with chris and lucy for even longer my second regret is that we're having to call this conversation to a close just mindful of time there are um including charlotte and peter there are five phenomenal um professionals on the screen who have achieved not without striving not without resilience so michael simon uma charlotte and Peter, Victoria's dropped away, but I really hope that today people have been able to take away that the road may be tough, but there are so many opportunities. And something that Michael said, he said, you know, I may do things differently from some of my co co colleagues at work. Yes, that may be true. There may be things that visually impaired people do differently, but my goodness, they do them equally and just as successfully. And it's just about ensuring that you advocate, find your, find your route, and um, ensure that the resilience is there. So I'm really struck. Charlotte, I don't know if you've got any key, key thoughts that you wanted to share. Yes, absolutely. And just wanted to say a massive thanks to everybody. Um, I think everything I heard is that, you know, everyone, we are all on a journey. Um, people's sight changes over time as well. And it's not easy at the start. It really isn't. And I think we've heard from everyone today about their journeys and how they've grown in confidence and learn to smash down barriers. And it's a process and you will get there. And there's, 
masses of support out there that we'll put in our resources at the end of this event today and connect with you so you can know where to get help. But just fantastic to hear everybody's journeys.